All right, welcome to the channel. Do you ever find yourself confused when people start talking that painting mumbo jumbo? Well, this is the video for you. Today, I'm gonna break down the most popular painting terms so you know exactly what your favorite YouTubers and streamers are talking about. So let's get into it. Volumes is probably the most common term used to describe the 3D shapes that make up our models. If we take a look at this marine, we can see it's made up of several different volumes, mainly spheres and cylinders. All models can be broken down into simple volumes and shapes to help better understand how we should be highlighting our models. There are multiple different types of highlights that you can apply to your miniatures, but at its core, a highlight is either an increase in value or intensity of the base color. They improve the readability of a shape or a detail within our model and help to convey the lighting direction. So highlights can also be used to emphasize the shape of a volume and we generally call these volumetric highlights. Where we place our highlights, specular highlights, reflections, bounce lights and so on all affect how the volume is perceived and the readability of the shape. Specular highlights and reflections, these ones get thrown about quite a lot and somewhat interchangeably, but specular highlights occur on shiny surfaces. This is where the light bounces off the surface at the same relative angle that it approaches and this can change based off the position of the light and the viewer. If you look at a pool ball or a snooker ball, the position of the highlight and the specular highlight changes relative to where the light is and how you're looking at the ball. So on a matte surface like some materials or a dull surface or anything that has a lot of surface texture, you'll actually get a diffused reflection. And this is where the light tends to bounce off in multiple different directions due to the uneven surface of the material. So because we're talking about highlights and reflections, I think it's important to understand the different types of lighting that can affect our model and our scene. So you'll obviously have a direct light or main source of light that's interacting with the piece. Generally we'll say it's the sun, but in other times it may be a light or something else. But this is generally the most intense form of light that's interacting with your model or your scene. And that's your primary light source. So whenever the primary light source passes by the model and hits the ground or the wall or another surface and then hits your model, that's generally referred to as a bounce light because it has bounced off another surface before it interacts with your model. So you'll generally see this in shattered areas or parts of your model that aren't being hit by the primary light source. You'll see a lot in non-metallic metals and true metallic metals and generally anything that has a very strong directional light within the scene. An important thing to note about bounce lights is they'll not be the same intensity as the primary light source and that the color of the light will be muddied by the color of the surface that is bounced off. Your scene may also have a secondary light source. These are often referred to as OSL or object source lighting. This can either occur in the scene or outside of the scene of your miniature. This is generally a less intense light than your primary light source, but also has some other color variation or a different hue that influences the scene or how your model is perceived. Within your scene, you'll have a primary light, you can have a secondary light, but you may also have ambient light. Whenever you're outside, there's generally an ambient blue light. It's very, very light blue that occurs within the scene that helps to illuminate areas that are in shadow. Um, and it's why you don't have like super harsh directional shadows all the time where you have that wee bit of blur. Whenever we're talking about shadows, there's also this idea of ambient occlusion. So this is an area where no primary light gets in and no secondary light or no ambient light gets into the scene or into that area. And it's effectively a place of pure shadow. Now, whenever I talk about hue, what I'm actually referring to is the family or the name of a color. If we look at XV88, Wa Flesh, Emperor's Children, these are all names that we can associate with certain armies and understand what the color is, but none of these names actually explain what the color is or what hue it belongs to. Generally we can describe a color by its name, red, blue, green and so on and you can get combinations of like reddish brown, yellow, orange and this gives us a clear picture of what color it is and help to build the language around it. So this leads us nicely onto the primary colors that people tend to use within miniature painting. So when people are talking about the primaries these are referring to two different color wheels. You either have red, yellow, blue or you have cyan, yellow, and magenta. These colors are considered primaries within those color wheels because you can't mix them out of other colors. There are some exceptions, but we'll not get into that in this video. The color wheels are then broken down into secondary colors and tertiary colors that are created by mixing the primary colors. I'll do a full breakdown and explanation of the different color wheels and how they can be applied to miniature painting in some future videos. 
because they deserve an entire video of their own. They're a fully in-depth topic. So now we've talked about hue and we understand what exactly that is, we're gonna talk about saturation, chroma, and intensity. Now these terms basically mean the same thing for the most part. They can be used interchangeably and often are within different videos. But basically this is how bright or dull a color is. Here we have a saturated red, saturated blue, and a saturated yellow. And then on this side we have basically got a desaturated red, a desaturated blue, and then a high value desaturated yellow. Now value refers to the relative lightness or darkness of a color and you can see that best between black and white which sit at opposite ends of the value scale. So you can adjust a color's saturation or its value in a multitude of different ways and we're just going to cover off some of the more basic ones here with a tint, a shade and a tonal shift within the color. So a tint is where you add white to the color to create a lighter version of the color. An example of this would be whenever you tint uh, red you end up with a pink color. Now a shade is whenever you just add black to darken it down and then a tone is where you add grey which basically doesn't change the value but changes the intensity of the colour so lowering the saturation of the colour. So now we understand value we can talk about contrast. Generally in miniature painting when people talk about contrast they mean value contrast and that's the difference between your brightest highlights and your darkest shadows. Generally higher value contrast will improve the readability and impact of your model but there are other forms of contrast. So you have temperature contrast because most colours generally have a temperature associated to them whether it be warm or cool and this can have a big impact on how your model is perceived and the scene that you're setting. So you can have colour contrast because certain colours contrast more with each other than others. So if we think about uh, complementary sets which are opposite sides of the colour wheel they appear to be more contrasting than other colours. You can have saturation contrast as well which is where you have the difference between the saturation of your colours. Generally whenever you're painting a model or painting a scene you only really want to use some fully saturated colours. If you have too many of them it appears to be noisy and messy. Finish or texture, so having different textures or finishes across your model helps create another form of contrast. You may have satin finishes, gloss finishes, matte finishes, textured areas, smooth areas, and all of these affect how the model is perceived and the emotion behind it. So now we understand volumes, reflections, colors, and contrast. Let's take a look at some of the most common paint consistency terms. I'm gonna kick it off with a layer consistency. A layer is probably the most common consistency and creates smooth opaque layers in one to three passes without leaving any visible brush strokes. It's great for blocking in areas and establishing base tones. A glaze or a wash consistency, effectively these can be used interchangeably because it's the application that changes but this is a heavily diluted version of your paint so there's less pigment suspended within the medium creating more transparent paint. Another consistency of paint that has kind of grown in popularity over recent years is contrast paints, speed paints or express paints. So now we understand the most common paint consistencies, we can look at the most common techniques. We're going to start off with layering which is where you use distinct layers of paint on top of each other to create a gradient or transition within your miniature. So you can follow up with some washing to pick out those recessed details. And washing is essentially flooding your model with that glaze or wash consistency paint and allowing it to settle in the recesses to create some solid panel lining within your miniature. A number of companies make washes or similar products for this process but you should definitely experiment with making your own by thinning down your paint to create the right consistency to get into those recesses. Then you have glazing which is also the application of a heavily thinned version of a paint over an area but this time you do it with control by wicking off the excess and applying it over a surface to either change or adjust the hue of the colour, adjust the temperature, the saturation or the value or even just smooth out a transition. This is generally quite a time intensive process because you're using quite transparent layers you have to build it up over multiple passes. So then we get on to filtering which is similar to glazing but we're applying it all over the area so again we're wicking off the excess and applying it to adjust the colour or boost the intensity. Now this can be done with a brush or an airbrush. Wet blending is whenever you blend paint directly on the model. Take one colour, apply it to your miniature, clean off your brush, grab your second and push the second colour into the first to start to build a smooth transition between the two colours. 
There's a variation on wet blending that's known as loaded brush. This is a technique popularized by Ben back in the day, but essentially what you need to do is load the belly of your brush with one color and then dip the tip of your brush into another. Whenever you apply this to the mini, the first color applies and then through capillary action, the second color gets pulled in and they blend together to give you a smooth transition. Generally this works better if you have a thinner color in the belly to allow it to flow out of the brush with the capillary action and a thicker paint on the tip. Feathering and two brush blending. These are pretty much the same thing. There's just different ways to go about it. So feathering is whenever you apply a color, you clean off your brush and then you feather out the edge of the paint to create a soft transition between the colors. Two brush blending is basically the same thing, but instead of cleaning your brush, you just grab a clean, damp brush and perform the feathering action. I find the two brush blending to be a wee bit more awkward because of how I hold the paintbrush, but for some people, it definitely works better. Stippling is the process of painting by dots. It creates distortion, visual confusion that allows you to create smooth, seamless blends quite easily by using these tiny dots to create your gradients. This allows you to be very deliberate and precise with the application and creation of light and shadow and it's also a fantastic way to create texture within your blends. Hatching and cross hatching, if you've ever done any pencil drawings or pen drawings in the past, you know that this is a great way to create depth, shading and texture within your drawings. It's exactly the same for miniature painting. So this technique can be used to create texture, tonal or shading effects by painting closely spaced parallel lines. And then if you overlap these lines with perpendicular ones, you essentially have cross hatching. Dry brushing has become extremely popular recently with the introduction of Slap Chop and with Artist Opus making more videos. But dry brushing is where you take a relatively dry brush, do not use a totally dry brush, to create gradients and transitions on your miniature. So it's a technique where you remove most of the paint from the brush, leaving trace amounts to deposit that on the model. This creates subtle transitions or gradients between colors and allows you to catch the edges of details quite easily and quickly. Then you have overbrushing, very similar to dry brushing, but instead of removing most of the paint, you only remove some of it. And this allows you to quickly establish base layers over an area while still leaving deep, dark shadows. Edge highlighting is where we apply thin highlights to the edge of each component within the model, effectively outlining all of the components in the miniature. It adds more pronounced details, clear separation, distinction and readability in the model. It's also synonymous with the heavy metal style and games workshop. Now one thing to keep in mind when it comes to edge highlighting is that the heavy metal style doesn't use any form of directional light. It's just lit from all directions and even amount. So if you're using edge highlighting in combination with other techniques, you'll need to adjust for the value differential. So zenithal priming and directional priming is when you prime your miniature implying the direction of the light. Zenithal priming is when the sun is at its zenith or straight up right above the miniature. And then directional priming, you can choose the direction of your light within the scene. Non-metallic metals or NMM for short is the process of representing a metallic surface without using any metallic paints or pigment. So essentially where you paint the reflections by hand, similar to how they would have done in 2D art. This has become very popular in the competition scene over a number of years and is continuing to grow in popularity. True metallic metals or TMM is the same process but using metallic paints. I'll be working to create more in-depth guides on each of these topics and linking them below in the description when they're ready. Hopefully you found that useful. If you have any comments, questions or suggestions for future videos, please drop them below in the comments. And if you want to take your painting to the next level, I have a Patreon that's focused around feedback and coaching. You also get access to exclusive guides and content. If you want to show me what you've been working on or what you've been using these videos for, please head over to the Discord and drop some pics into the whips or the completed project. I would love to see what you've been doing. Just want to say thank you again for watching and I'll catch you at the next one. All links can be found below in the description and don't forget to like and subscribe. Just remember you lost the game.